Well, this evening we're looking at uh, Luke chapter 6 again, uh, this time verses 27 through 30, um, 38. I mean, let's see, no, not through 38. Uh, it looks like we're going through verse 36. Yes. So let me read that as we, um, as we begin. I guess I, I didn't put that in the, um, um, the bulletin as I should have. Okay, beginning in verse 27, Jesus says this. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you, Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. May the Lord um, bless his word to our hearing, and may he particularly give us grace to do what he calls us to do in in this passage. Now remember this morning we saw... What Jesus said would be true of everyone who has been changed by his spirit, whose heart is set on the kingdom. Remember, the Beatitudes are are not a series of things that we do in order to obtain the reward, but a series of characteristics, Jesus says, will be true of those who actually receive the reward. Jesus is the one who has to qualify us, and he does that by giving us his Holy Spirit. So, what, what are these characteristics? Well, first of all, that we would be humble enough to put aside our own righteousness and trust Jesus alone to enter into heaven. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the poor in spirit. Also, we saw that we would be willing, as the rich young ruler was not, to give up all of our own possessions to see ourselves not as the owners of the things that we actually possess, but rather as stewards of what we have for the glory of God, Uh, that we would grieve over our sins, blessed are those who weep, that we would be willing uh, in this grieving over our sins to do the difficult work, to suffer the difficult work, as Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, of plucking out our eyes and cutting off our hands and feet, which he doesn't mean literally, but rather the putting our, um, our sins to death, which often feel like members of our body, in order that we might become more like Jesus. And that we would also be grieved by the sins of those around us um, and not be content to leave their sins essentially un- unaddressed because knowing that the Lord hates them and they will eventually be destroyed for these very things if they continue in them, to reach out to them and to try to help them find their way to Jesus. And again, I would just uh, mention the best way to do that is through relationship. You know, we can perhaps talk to everybody we see. uh, If if we just see somebody once and we talk to them, that's still better than not talking to them at all. But it's more effective if we get to know the person and they get to know us. Jesus said also uh, one of the characteristics is that we be willing to be hated and to be ostracized, to be insulted, to be scorned, and even considered evil for doing what God says is right. And if you wonder whether that's going to happen, I don't know if any of you actually would, but it does. People look at us as being evil and intolerant 
if we stand up for what the Lord says is right. We need to be willing to do that, and we are willing to do that if we have the Spirit of God within us. Now, this price is a high price to pay. As a matter of fact, it has cost some people their lives. But we know that's why Jesus told us in advance to count the cost before we begin to follow him. Are we willing to pay the price? If we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are willing. Actually, there is nothing else that we can do. Uh, once our hearts are essentially captured uh, by the, the kingdom of heaven, by the treasure hidden in the field, by the pearl of great price, which is essentially Jesus and his kingdom, we are compelled from within to give everything we have so that we might have these things. And again, it's not a work we do to be saved. This love, this desire does not come from us, but it comes from the Lord. Again, these are those fruits of the Spirit's work. Now, this evening, Jesus tells us next how we should respond to those who are going to hate us for doing what is right. And the response is that we need to continue to love them and show them mercy, even as our Heavenly Father does. We need to remember that He is hated every day by the people of this world, and yet He continues to show them mercy and give them good things. Now, Jesus tells us, first of all, in verses 27 and 28, that we need to return good for their evil. He says this, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Now, Jesus says, I say to you who hear, because he realizes as he speaks, there's going to be those who hear what he says, and there are going to be those, in a sense, who, who hear what he says, but they're not going to respond to it. So those who are willing to listen, made willing by the Holy Spirit, if the Father has given us ears to hear, if he has changed our hearts in the way that we have seen this morning, Jesus is saying this is what he wants us to do. This is how he wants us to respond to our enemies. Love your enemies, Jesus says. Now, we know from our experience, as I've already said, this is one of the hardest things that Jesus calls us to do, because more often than not, our response is to hate our enemies and to want to even the score. They hurt us, so we want to hurt them back. They hurt us, they injure us, and so we want justice and not mercy. We want God to deal with this. Uh, we want to see them be injured in the same way that we are injured. But Jesus is telling us that that's not what we should want. What we should want instead is mercy, mercy upon them, that we should show them mercy and desire God's mercy on them. So what does this mercy look like? That's actually what Jesus is describing for us here. What it looks like is this, that instead of doing something spiteful in return for their injuries, we are to do something good for them. We are to help them. We are to serve them. We are to meet their needs if we see them in, in some form of difficulty. If they happen to curse us, instead of cursing them in return, instead of speaking evil, I think the uh, terminology today is talking smack about them, we are to call upon the Lord to be merciful. You know, we are not to speak evil of them. We are not to smear their reputation. We're not to try to get even, you know, for the, again, the injuries that they may have caused to us, but rather we are to bless them. And I think what Jesus means here is that we are to speak charitably about them, as charitably as we can, which reminds me, there, there was a quote by William Perkins that talks about how we ought to uh, treat other people, and, uh, and I think along these lines, is he's, he's encouraging us to do this to, to bless them, to speak charitably. Uh, and I think even beyond this, you know how um, we often say God bless you and things of that nature? I think Jesus is saying something of, of that effect. When we say God bless you, what we're doing is we're calling upon the Lord, asking him to show mercy or to, to show some kindness to you in some way. In, when somebody curses us, that's the way we are to respond. And Jesus says, further, we are to pray for them. Pray that, uh, not that the Lord would 
come down on them in judgment, but that He would be gracious to them and lead them to His Son that they might find forgiveness. And again, think about the greatest example that uh, we have in the Scripture of this very thing. When our Lord Jesus Christ was, was on the cross, He had authority, as we know. He could have called down a legion of angels to destroy the world if He wanted to. He could have called down fire from heaven. Remember, the disciples knew He could do that, and they actually asked Jesus on one occasion, is this what you want? But Jesus didn't do that, even after all the torture, all the ridicule, all the, uh, you know, the abuse that they had given to Him. But rather, Jesus prayed, and He prayed this in Luke 23, verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now, again, that's an example Jesus gives to us. This is what He wants us to do. He wants us to pray for them, show them kindness and mercy. Now, secondly, he tells us in verse 29, and what he really has uh, in mind here, I think, is when they take us to court, when they sue us, we are not to retaliate. Jesus says, whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also, and whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Now, when Jesus tells us to offer the other cheek, it's generally believed that He's not talking about this literally. Um, I, I remember seeing a, a particular movie that was made about uh, where Peter, somebody comes up to Peter and smacks him on one side of the cheek, and, and Peter rears up to, to punch him back, and he says, well, wait a minute, didn't Jesus say turn the other cheek? And so he kind of Rawr. goes like, puts his, puts his hands down and turns the other cheek, and they hit him on that one too. That's not what really the Lord is telling us to do here, we are not to become a punching bag for our enemies or to tempt people to injure us, uh, who, who injure us, to injure us again, or to continue to sin against us by doing this. Remember the sixth commandment that tells us not to take away life also gives us the right to defend ourselves, to defend our life as well as the lives of others. If somebody comes after us and attacks us, we have the right to defend ourselves. If they attack others that, that are too weak to defend themselves, or maybe who can, we, we need to help them as well. That's not really what Jesus is talking about here. He's, he, what He's doing is quoting a proverbial expression that, that means that we are patiently to bear the injuries that someone might inflict on us. And I think the context here is in a court of law. If they sue us for our coat, we might think that's kind of a strange thing, but coats were used for sureties and they were valuable possessions and somebody might actually take us to court in those days and sue us for our coat. Jesus says, don't resist them. And if they want to come after you a second time, turn the other cheek, let them have your shirt also. In other words, don't retaliate. Don't uh, come after them. Don't even necessarily defend yourself in the situation if by so doing you're going to injure the gospel, but rather bear these unjust injuries uh, rather than fight against them. You know, the author to the Hebrews actually commends his readers for doing this very thing. He says they accepted joyfully the seizure of their property and they did it knowing that they have a better and a lasting possession in heaven. So the author to the Hebrews says, you, you've already suffered many things. Don't throw that away by basically leaving Christ and going back to the old covenant system. Well, again, the Lord tells us that if somebody comes after us in this way, in order to give a, um, a testimony to the gospel, we should be willing to, to bear those injuries. Again, showing mercy. Now, thirdly, Jesus says this in verse 60, give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Now, again, this, this may sound rather global. I think perhaps this passage may concern us um, when we read it, perhaps more than it really needs to, because I don't think Jesus is telling us here that we, we give to absolutely everyone, because there are certain people that Jesus doesn't want us to give to, particularly if somebody comes and asks us who isn't in need. I don't think we're bound to give 
our possessions to somebody who isn't in need. We're actually expressly forbidden in Scripture to give to somebody who, who is the, essentially the proverbial sluggard, you know, the one that Solomon talks about, who habitually refuses to work. Paul tells us in cases like this that we are to let them go hungry so that they will learn to work. Let me read you the passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. You know, rather than eating up the bread of others, you know, earn your own bread and, and, and eat that. So hunger does motivate one you know, to, to work. So this, this isn't essentially a, a command to give to whoever asks. Um, again, if you, if you give to people who really should be working, you're, you're only creating a problem. And if, if I may just draw our attention to something very obvious, this is one of the problems we actually face in our current governmental system, our welfare system, isn't it? Because it can actually train people not to work. So, I mean, there are people who have a need, and I think it's okay to help those in real need. That's what Jesus is telling us to do. But not to train people not to work and just simply work the system. Now, what he has in mind here, what he appears to have in mind, is not refusing to give somebody something who is in need, who happens also to be our enemy. We are to do what we can to help them and to do it freely without expecting that they repay us. And he could also have in mind here another court case where somebody takes this from us legally that we are not to seek redress, but just simply let it go. Now, Jesus summarizes all of this in the golden rule. You know, what, what is sort of the takeaway principle that is sort of ready at hand to know how to basically govern a situation where we're confronted with um, even the needs of our enemies. Uh, Jesus says this in verse 31, treat others the same way you want them to treat you. He wants us to put ourselves in their position. Think about uh, how we would want someone to treat us if we were in uh, the same or similar circumstances that, that they're in. Uh, I think what he would have us to do or what we would want someone else to do if we happen to have injured that person and they're the only one around who could help us is to put aside the fact that, that basically they're an enemy and think about them purely from the standpoint as a neighbor in need. Now, can you think of any examples in Scripture where this very thing actually took place? We're going to see this later in um, Luke's Gospel because Luke's Gospel is the only place we have recorded for us the parable of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, when he saw his enemy lying on the ground, beaten and left half dead by the road, he didn't think, this is my enemy, I'm just going to pass by on the other side. But rather, when he saw him, Jesus said he felt compassion, which means he entered into his sufferings, right? He saw him not as an enemy, but as a neighbor that is in need, and he reached out and met the needs of his enemy without expecting anything in return, right? He didn't um, tell the innkeeper, this, this is where I'm going to be, and when this guy wakes up, let him know that he owes me this much money, but he basically gave the innkeeper enough money to take care of him, and if it costs you any more, next time I see you, I will repay. I will do this at my own expense, okay? Well, Jesus, at the end of the parable, says, I want you to go and do the same. When you see your enemy in need, you know, enter into their suffering. Don't, don't let hardness of heart keep you from showing compassion. Now, again, Jesus, like with the Beatitudes, has already given us the ability to do this. He's given to us a supernatural love, hasn't he? one that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit is love, not the kind of love the world experiences, but it is a love that is greater. We have the ability to do more 
than the people of the world, than those who are in darkness have. This is that light that is supposed to be shining from us. And so our Lord wants us to do more than basically they can do as a witness to them. And that's what Jesus means when he says in verses 32 through 34, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. If we only do what the world does, what, you know, how is that going to be a witness? It's, it's just going to be, again, blending in, uh, doing what everybody else does. But if we do what nobody else does, show compassion toward those who hate us, that is going to be a witness to them. Jesus goes on to say that what he's really after here is that we imitate him, that as we imitate Jesus, remember Jesus, what, what is Jesus showing us except what the Father is like? This is what Jesus did. Jesus showed mercy and compassion to his enemies wherever he went, in his teaching, in his healing, in his even providing food for them on occasion. But he points out the fact here that this is what our Heavenly Father is doing at all times. The one whose spirit and love has, that he has put in our hearts, he wants us, Jesus says, he wants us to love our enemies as our Father in heaven loves his enemies. Jesus says in verses 35 and 36, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. So we are to imitate God. I mean, basically, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1 that, that God is revealing himself through the creation. One of the things he reveals is his kindness and mercy. There, it, it crowns all of his creation. Everything that everyone has, every good thing comes down from the, from the Father. So God is good every day. And yet every day people are not giving him thanks. They are not um, praising him. They are not thanking him. Um, the Lord wants us to imitate that mercy and that kindness of the Lord. Now, let me just uh, do sort of a little bit of a, of a sidetrack right here because as I was looking at this passage, it reminded me of, of a particular theology that um, is kind of in the Reformed camp that I think we need to be aware of. There is this belief, there is this theology, this doctrine. If you haven't run into it yet, uh, you should be thankful, but, but perhaps sometime that you will. We have run into this in the past that basically teaches that, um, thinking now about the sovereignty of God, okay, that God is sovereign. And we know that God has sovereignly chosen that he's going to save some and others he's going to pass over in, in his mercy, right? God isn't dealing with the whole human race the same way. All mankind has fallen in, in sin and lost and on their way to, to, to hell, right? But the Bible says that God has chosen to have mercy on some. He's going to change the hearts of some, and he's going to bring them to himself. And there are some that he's not going to. He's going to pass over them. He's going to leave them in their sins, and they're going to have to face the consequences of their sins. Well, this particular, we, we agree with that, but this, the particular belief is this, that because God has passed over some, and he intends to leave them in their sins and ultimately hold them accountable, and they're going to be destroyed for these things, that God never actually intends to do anything good for those individuals, okay? Um, essentially, what, what they believe is that because this is God's going to pass over them and he intends for them then ultimately to be destroyed, this is their view, that whatever he does for them in this world is only meant to lead them in that direction, ultimately to destroy them. God never does anything good for them, God, God never intends any kindness towards them, but everything he does is only to add up to their destruction. That gives kind of a, a dark view of, of God. Well, if you happen to run into somebody who believes this, 
then you really need to show them this verse, okay? Because this is what Jesus says about the Heavenly Father. He himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Can God said to be kind to someone if he's giving them something that's meant only to destroy them? You see, that, that's not what the Bible teaches about God and what, what he does and, and why he does it. Now, again, there, there are several things here that we may agree on. We do agree on the idea that, that God is sovereign. He does pass over some. He's going to hold them accountable. We call these the goats. And, and we also agree that they're going to have to answer for all the kindnesses that God shows them. I mean, God is showing them kindness. And they're not thanking him. They're not praising him. And eventually, they're going to have to stand before him, and they're going to have to give an answer for that. We, we certainly agree with that. But we would strongly disagree that the Lord gives them these things in order to destroy them. God shows everyone kindness. And that kindness is meant really to do one thing. It's meant to lead them to repentance. It's, made, it, it's meant to lead them to salvation, even if they never come to him. Paul writes this in Romans 2, verse 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness? and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. And then he goes on to say, but because of your stubborn and unrepentant hearts, you're just storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath. So he's saying God is showing you all this kindness, and he's speaking to the Jews, I think, primarily there in Romans 2. Uh, he's showing you all this kindness. This is what it's meant to do, but you're not, you're not listening to him. You're not following him. Instead, you're storing up wrath for the day of God's wrath. So the point is, the reason why God shows the kindness is meant to lead them to repentance. God shows kindness and mercy to his enemies, and it is well meant. Now, since that's what the Father does, you see, Jesus tells us that we are to do the same thing. Don't just show mercy or love your enemies because you have to, but to love them, to show them kindness, to be merciful, uh, that through this mercy and kindness that we show to them in his name, that he might lead his people to his son and to salvation. Jesus wants us to be pictures of the heavenly father and of his mercy, not, you know, basically those who are vindictive and want to get... Uh, uh, even with everyone, that doesn't represent the Father. That's not what He's like. We've already seen what He's like. That's what He wants us to be like. Now, Jesus says if we do this, that our reward will be great. Okay, our reward in this world, our reward in the next world. And He says that we will be sons of the Most High. And I don't think he means by doing this we'll become sons of the Most High, but by doing this we will show ourselves to be the sons of the Most High. That is, we will show ourselves to be the children of God, not just in name, but in nature. So we'll essentially vindicate or prove the fact that we actually do belong to God because we have the same kind of mercy coming from our lives that is coming from Him. If we don't take justice into our own hands, but we rather we show mercy, not only will we be blessed, but, um, you know, again, rewarded and show ourselves to be, again, the um, children of God. But the Lord uh, tells us one more thing, which is meant, I think, to help us do this. And that is to realize that these people who have injured us and these people who are perhaps unjustly our enemies and these who hate us for doing what is right, God is going to deal with them, isn't he? Okay? That's not all going to go uh, unnoticed. It's not going to go un unredressed. But we're not the ones that are supposed to redress it. Okay? God says he will do it. Now, he will do it in one of two ways. He will either you know, use that mercy and that kindness to lead that person to salvation, which is, of course, what our hope should be. But if not, he is going to give them justice, okay? One way or the other, those offenses are going to be dealt with. So in closing, let me just simply read what Paul writes. It, it's, it's a summary of everything that Jesus has just said. 
And I think, um, well, it actually would, would make a good couple of memory verses to memorize. But he writes in Romans chapter 12, verses 19 and 20. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And again, he'll do it in one of those two ways. So then he goes on to say this, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now, again, I don't think that's an act of kindness. I think that's essentially, it's going to bring God's judgment down on him if you show him this kindness and he continues to be his enemy. So Paul concludes by saying, do not be overcome by evil. Don't return evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. So again, may the Lord help us in this particular area. May he strengthen us to be able to return kindness and return mercy for the injuries that we suffer in this world, knowing that um, well, not only are we going to be rewarded for it, but the Lord is going to deal with the situation in the way that, that He intends. Don't take it into your hands. Let the Lord deal with it. Let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer.